Okay, good morning. This is Professor Otero uh, at the School for International Studies at San Francisco University. Uh, today, I'm going to present the second part of uh, Thomas Piketty's book, Capital in the 21st Century. Uh, and along with that, I'm presenting a series of, of data on the labor share of GDP in several countries. So inequality rising, this is the outline, uh, key question in social surplus, why inequality deepens the state in taxes. That's you know, one of the major portions of uh, Piketty's book, you know, the assertion that the state matters and taxes matter, and that is somewhere that uh, Heather Bushy takes off from, because I think she really elaborates on the specifics of what kind of state policies could be launched to mitigate uh, inequality. And that's why in her conclusion, he talks about distributional economics. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about Piketty and class analysis. I mean, what relationship is there, if any, between Thomas Piketty and class analysis, which is more identified with a Marxist type of analysis? So, okay, so which inequalities? I mean, there are obviously several axes for inequality. And I'm gonna be talking more about this uh, in two weeks. Uh, and uh, so we have on the one hand, uh, you know, one of the more important uh, bases of inequality in North America, racial and gender discrimination, which create unfair competitive advantages for some people and violate the ideal of a level playing field. Now, poverty is viewed as an important problem by this type of economics, but the main issue has, uh, has not been the distance between the poor and the rich. So uh, on this point, I would argue that it is theoretically possible in perhaps every country to eliminate official poverty rates while at the same time having a large and perhaps even growing distance between the poor and the rich. I mean, that's what inequality is all about. And if inequality is deepening, well, what that refers to is this growing distance between the poor and the rich. And that is a problem because um, that means that the rich are not only becoming richer, but they're also becoming more powerful. And if the rich become so much more powerful, that means that they will likely also control not just economic power, but also political and social power. Um, so instead of this focus on inequality, uh, it has been the absolute material deprivations of people living in poverty and how their unmet needs harm, harm them. So I think uh, one of the lessons from Piketty is that we also need to move forward and you know, beyond poverty and look at inequality. And uh, I guess a supplement from uh, Heather Boshi is that uh, inequality even hampers economic growth. So inequality was not an important publicly recognized issue. Piketty goes into a deep analysis of inequality of the top 1% compared to the rest of the population. That issue is how income is split between income from capital on the one hand and income from wages and salaries on the other hand. And it is the latter point that I will be focusing on in a series of graphs that I'm gonna be showing you on several countries. How much of a share of income 
is taken by wages and salaries. So Piketty's thesis, which we visited last week, capitalism in the 21st century is hurling toward even more extreme inequality. Inequality has existed in 300 years of its existence of capitalism, but it's now poised to deepen. In the United States, income among, among wage and salary earners is moving in the wrong direction. The difference between low income workers and high income employees is rising. The top 0.1% of the top 1% are pulling down the real increases in money incomes. So the difference here is you know, something that we talked about last week between particularly chief executive officers and average workers' incomes. Uh, and here I just wanna reiterate the reason why uh, a lot of these discussion focuses on the United States and not on other countries. And uh, I think, I mean, that question, in fact, was responded to by Heather Bausche because even though she focuses, you know, a lot on the United States, she does mention that, uh, you know, what happened in the United States reverberated across the world economy uh, precisely because the United States is the most important uh components of the world economy and not only that but also um united states diffuses the theory on which its public policies are based in fact not only diffuses but pushes uh i mean you know, liberal policies you know what we might call supply side economics that's been pushed uh, uh, and exported, you know, as an ideological export of the United States since the 1980s. So that's why, you know, if Karl Marx focused on England in the mid uh, 19th century, Thomas Piketty and others focused on the United States in the late 20th century and early 21st century because of that. So economists argue that wages are determined by workers' productivity. I think this was a theme that we entertained last week, uh, but for Piketty, this cannot explain top executive salaries. It is power that matters, he argues. Uh, to understand top executive salaries, we actually need to go well beyond economics into sociology, psychology, cultural and political history, and this study of beliefs and perceptions, at least as much as uh, for economics per se. So that really puts him aside from most economists who tend to be fairly autistic in a disciplinary way. I would argue a similar thing about the political scientists. Autistic in the sense that, you know, they only read uh, the journals of political scientists on one hand or of economists on the other hand. Uh, Bauschi, I think has mentioned, as far as I remember, I think only one sociologist in her whole book that was uh, Marion for Cod. And otherwise, you know, she's only mentioned economists and uh, political scientists, a few political scientists. So, even Heather Bausch, who is critiquing uh, her own discipline, is not sufficiently critical as to go outside of her discipline and get insights, for instance, from sociology, which, like I said, I mean, it's been studying inequality for decades. So the key question for Piketty is why is there this inequality. You know, the fact that we have that sign there and not an equal sign is because this is not an equation. It's an inequality relationship. Uh, so before I go on, I, I, you might notice that I, I used a much 
larger font here for uh, the rate of return on capital is greater than the growth rate. And the reason is that uh, I would say that this is the most important formula that uh, Thomas Piketty starts with. I mean, it's not, like I said, it's not an equation, but it is a formula that is really elegant and simple. And I think that makes his whole approach fairly appealing. I mean, uh, you might remember that uh, equation in, the, in that case, it is an equation uh, of um, Albert Einstein on uh, re his relativity theory. Can somebody tell me what, uh, what that equation is? You can uh, unmute your mic and tell me. Isn't it E equals MC squared? That's right. <laughs> e equals MC squared. So, I mean, it's, it's similarly elegant, right? And, and from that, you know, uh, I'm, I'm really amazed, you know, when I read some uh, reports on physics research, uh, that they time and again, they are confirming Einstein's predictions, you know, from the very early part of, of the 20th century. Uh, so I think this particular formula is probably going to be utilized uh, for a long time as well. And so, but I mean, rather than um, a logical necessity, says Piketty, this particular formula is more of a historical fact and not a logical necessity. And what he means by that is that, yes, this formula describes what's been happening in the history of capitalism, but if it is not a logical necessity, that means that it's possible to change it, right? How? Well, with state intervention. That's the key. So why inequality deepens? It is because of the capital to income ratio. So this is the structural basis for the distribution of income. All other things being equal for a given return on capital, the higher the capital income ratio, the higher the proportion of national income to wealth holders. So I guess in policy terms, these costs or relationship with inequality can also quite possibly give us the clue on how to reduce and perhaps eventually even eliminate inequality. That means that any policy um, public policy alternatives would probably have to focus on how to enhance the income of other groups so that capital takes away a lower share of this ratio, all right? So I mean, this ratio, you know, Piketty told us last week, uh, well, I told you that he says uh, that this ratio tends to be anywhere between six to one or seven to one. So what if we reduce that to, from, from that to say two to one, or maybe even, yeah, I guess you can reduce it much more than one to one. Uh, but even if you could reduce it from six to one to three to one, I mean, that would really leave a lot of room to enhance people's stations in life, you know, and, and the possibility for a lot of people to really change their life chances, their, their livelihoods. So why inequality deepens? Well, again, because that gives greater power to capital. Remember, I used K to symbolize capital. So the larger the fortune, the higher the return on capital because larger capital hires better money managers and lawyers or finds better way to evade taxes. You know, just as they can hire better uh, money managers, they can also hire better accountants to seek 
the, the tax havens and so on and so forth. So the last uh, point here is that democracy is in the greatest jeopardy as money is power and inherited fortunes are power on steroids. So uh, here I'm gonna start with this uh, series of data. This is uh, one of the longest series of data because it pertains to the United States and logically, uh, FRED, you know, the Federal Reserve Economic Database, uh, they pay particular attention to, to US data. And this is the only graph that you're gonna see with these shaded areas here. And what that means is that in those shaded years, there was a recession, okay? So in most cases, you're gonna see that where there is a recession, the share of labor, uh, labor compensation from the gross domestic product declines. It's you know really inevitable, perhaps. I don't know. I mean, this actually I think reflects the huge power of capital. I mean, this was a very short recession here, but look at this one. I mean, this this really this has been a really long decline. Uh, these are the years, by the way, that are also mentioned by uh, Heather Bushy, that during the Bill Clinton's years, there was an expansion that did allow workers to capture a larger share of income. I had told you that the past couple of weeks, because I showed different versions of this particular uh, information, when I was comparing Canada and Mexico to the United States, we also had this uh, bump here uh, for US workers. <clears throat> now, something I, I want you to pay attention to as we go along is the axis of the uh, Y here, the range of, or the, of the ratio. Uh, U.S. workers never have captured in this time series quite as much as 65% of the share of the GDP. It's always been below that, okay? And mostly between about 63% and now it's down to, oh, about 59.7%. Uh, so something interesting here is that, uh, I mean, unfortunately we don't have the exact years, but I know from other information that uh, during the Donald Trump years, there was a little bit of a bump for, uh, for wages, all right? And one possible reason for that is that Donald Trump completely canceled um, immigration almost completely. I mean, if there used to be, let's say 800,000 migrants into the US, there were well below uh, 50,000 migrants uh, going during the Donald Trump years. And so that generated labor scarcity. And so by, by the sheer uh, forces of supply and demand, you know, workers were able to command better wages during that time. Uh, but still, I mean, well below the the better times for labor. I guess the best time for labor was the late 1960s. And it kind of continued into the 70s, but after the mid 1970s, you know, there's a, a continued decline when with that bump during Clinton, the Clinton years, et cetera. Uh, Something that I was kind of surprised about is that Canada started out in the highest level of uh, labor compensation in the GDP or, or share of labor compensation in the GDP at above 75%. I mean, it's, it's actually, you know, more than 77% in this year, you know, before the 1975. 
And after that, it's gone down. I mean, it went up a bit uh, right before the start of NAFTA, actually. But after 1994, well, even before then, I guess 1993 or so, uh, the share of labor compensation in GDP for Canada in current national prices started to go down. And, you know, it, it hit this level, which is below 66%. So if you notice, I mean, that's, that's about 11 percentage points less than the top. So if anything, globalization has not been great for workers. If, you know, this is an okay measure of how workers have fared. It is quite possible though, and so th let's not be deceived by something that is quite possible that workers with their income have been able to buy a lot more stuff, you know, a lot more t-shirts, TVs, even cars and so on. But that's because, you know, a lot of that stuff has become cheaper because of globalization, right? But the question that we're addressing in this class is inequality. Are workers, besides being able to buy more stuff, are workers more or less powerful vis-a-vis -vis capital? For Mexico, oh, Mexico is a very sad case for me because uh, look how low it starts, you know, at uh, you know around 43%, and it goes so much lower to 36%. And there is clearly also a NAFTA effect. Uh, I didn't bother, uh, you know, downloading the data before 1993 because it was just a flat line, you know. And maybe that fine line means that they don't have the data there either. But uh, I guess it's not coincidental that Fred became interested in, more interested in Mexico, you know, right before the start of, of NAFTA. So that's when they, when they start to capture all this information. And by the way, the, the sources are usually these two universities, University of Groningen and University of California, Davis. So, and yet, I mean, all that data is deposited in the, the Federal Reserve Economic Database and you can construct, uh, I mean, you can download you know, like a PDF uh, or type of file or a PPT type of file, you know, for PowerPoint, or you can download the data for Excel and so on. It, it's extremely useful. You know, a lot of economists use these databases. Piggy's conclusions. The world to come may well combine the worst of the past two worlds. I mean, uh, you know, Piketty is very dire. He is uh, very pessimistic in his conclusions. And the past, uh, uh, the two past worlds, so very large inequality of inherited wealth on the one hand, and very high wage inequalities in the form of chief executive office compensations, in this case, justified in terms of merit and productivity, which Piketty thinks are claims with very little factual basis as noted. Meritocratic extremism can thus lead to a race between super managers on the one hand and rentiers on the other hand, to the detriment of those who are neither. So rentiers are the people with the most inherited wealth who are rent seekers. I warned you about uh, that difference, you know, in, in the way of using the, the word rent, uh, which can be for, you know, like when you rent your apartment, etc. But there's also the, the sense used in economics as, you know, rent seeking, which means, as Boshi very well defined it, as seeking a profit above and beyond the average rate of profits. All right, so that would be rent, a super profit. <clears throat> and so obviously if 
we are left between these super managers who are making, you know, hundreds of times more than average workers and rent seekers, then that is going to be to the detriment of everybody else. So um, comparing with the 1948 UN Declaration of Human Rights, what we saw there, I mean, this was the goal for development in humanity, uh, that Declaration on Human Rights established the right to food, shelter, freedom from poverty, healthcare, good education, and a job paying a living wage. The only way to change course is through strong political interventions. So here we're getting to how to get there, meaning beyond inequality. So I'm gonna have about three slides on the state in taxes. The first one is this, the only remedy, and I'm going back to the earlier part of the book, <clears throat> the only remedy is political intervention. There is no natural spontaneous process to prevent destabilizing inegalitarian forces from prevailing permanently. So power exercised by the state is especially important in counteracting the inegalitarian forces of the market through taxation, income transfers, and a range of regulations. And I think here is where Heather Boshi comes in because she uh, makes uh, more concrete, more tangible kinds of uh, policy recommendations. So Piketty supports expansive social services for health, retirement and education, as well as regulation for financial markets. Worker ownership, a la Sweden type. I mean, this is one of the reasons why I used the Swedish example, because at the time when there was worker ownership, you know, the share of labor compensation in Sweden really spiked up. And a wide range of other policies that are generally part of the European welfare state and can help spread wealth and curve excessive inequality. So notice here that we have a, a range of policies that uh, are well beyond the economy per se. So if we conceive of the economy in a broader sense, you know, as embedded in the rest of society, we can see how health policies for instance, I guess Canada is not doing too bad in that regard. I mean, when I got here in the 1990s, I had the distinct impression that the health services in Canada were being artificially and deliberately starved of resources so that people might say, oh my God, you know, this really doesn't work. Let's privatize. And I mean, you know, there, there were people who started to privatize uh, parts of the healthcare system in Alberta, for instance. And, but of course, the alternative is to dedicate larger funding for health so that we can cut the, the queues, for instance, in, in operations and so on and so forth. And I mean, perhaps, well, I, I know you are too young to notice that um, when you go past the the most usual kind of uh, medical services, that's when the, the medical system in Canada begins to get a little bumpy, you know, because there is insufficient uh, funding for, for health. And I guess there is insufficient funding for medicine. So one of the movements right now is to make all medicines included. I'm not gonna say free because there's nothing free, but included in the welfare package for Canadians. Um, but of course, uh, uh, well, retirement, you know, to better retirement uh, benefits, education. I think education in this country has gone in the opposite direction because I mean, when I got here, uh, tuitions were really, really symbolic, close to free. Now they're, well, you tell me, 
how are they? <laughs> They're probably a lot more expensive. And that's because the state has really the, uh, lowered the amount of subsidy to universities. I mean, universities get funding from, well, primarily from the provincial government, but that's through funding that comes from the federal government. And so, you know, that funding needs to increase. For me, ideally, all levels of education should be included. Again, I'm not saying free, but they should be included that none of the students should be paying any tuition at all. Uh, so everybody who has the academic merits to study university, they should be able to study university. And I mean, one of the, I would say, very perverse trends that have happened is that careers like medicine or law or business, which are considered the kinds of majors that will lead its graduates to earn more, they're made more expensive. To me, that's absolutely ridiculous because that means that less privileged people are going to have a lower access to the kinds of majors that will lead them to earn a little more. If they do earn a little more, that's fine. You know, have a progressive tax system. And through that tax system, they're going to return to society, whatever society gave them to be able to study medicine or architecture or civil engineering or, you know, all those uh, disciplines that have a premium intuition fees. That is really ridiculous, but it is completely understandable in the neoliberal paradigm. Because one of the things that ne the neoliberal paradigm has done is to transfer responsibility to individuals for things that society really should be looking after. Um, so we notice that uh, worker ownership, that would be at a very micro economic level of the firm, all right? So we have a kind of policies that really cross a, uh, cut across different levels of society and not just the economy, strictly speaking. Um, okay, so without taxes, society has no common destiny and collective action is impossible. So if you read a sociological classic like Max Baber, one of the things that he says is that the only actor that can act on a societal level is the state. I mean, all other actors may have agency, but their agencies are much more limited than the societal level. So um, I guess, you know, there's a lot of talk about agency, but uh, I guess, what is the proper dimension of such agency? I mean, does any, anybody in this class think that they have agency? And if so, please tell me on what? I mean, you do have certain levels of agency, but what is the realm that your agency can affect? Can somebody give me an example? Like the private realm, like what you do with your life and, and your choices, like who your partner is, or like what your, I guess to an extent, what your job is. Yeah, I mean, you can also choose to not go to university, but if you do choose to go to university, you can choose to go to Simon Fraser, or you can choose to go to UBC, or yeah, I mean, you do have a, a number of choices, right? But those choices will affect primarily your own individual life chances and what is going to be your station in life. But whatever you choose, it's not necessarily going to change society. So when we're talking here about inequality on a societal level, what we need is a social transformation 
that only a societal level actor can change. And that actor is inequivocally the state because only the state can engage in this type of collective action. Uh, let me qualify that. I guess there's another type of collective actor that can possibly change some things and those are social movements. So social movements can push the state to change the kinds of policies that have deepened inequality. And perhaps that's the only way that the state is going to introduce that kind of policies, all right? And that's where your individual agency also comes in, in choosing to act as a collective actor in some social movements. So, well, one key to the American Revolution was no taxation without representation. So what that uh, particular phrase tells you is that, uh, uh, I mean, to the extent that people are paying taxes, they need democratic representation. And right now, even democracy is in jeopardy. So picketing class analysis, and I'm very close to finishing here. Uh, South African miners on strike. I mean, there was an example that Piketty uh, drew on, on page 59, and where he said, for those who own nothing but their labor power, and that I would highlight, that phrase labor power was used by Marx, all right? So I'm not sure if that was deliberate or not, not on Piketty's part, but he is using that phrase from Marx, uh, who own nothing but their labor power and who often live in humble conditions, it is difficult to accept that the owners of capital, some of whom have inherited at least part of their wealth, are able to appropriate so much of the wealth produced by their labor. So the owners of capital do not simply receive a return on capital, they exploit the miners, and this is in Piketty's terms. Well, I'm not sure, no, because the, the, the quotation marks start actually here. So maybe I introduced that particular word. They exploit the miners by appropriating wealth produced by their labor. So I'm, I'm rephrasing uh, Piketty's term using Marx's term. Because I mean, Marx, what he did was provide a theory of exploitation. So rather than a division of national income pi into shares, it is a transfer of wealth from labor to capital. So chief executive officers, although different from stockholding, chief, chief executive officers earnings and other compensation should be thought of as, in part at least, a return on capital. I'm saying this because Piketty treats the income of chief executives as wages. And I think that's just plain wrong because a lot of the income that chief executive officers receive is actually in the form of capital because you know, I mean, they receive shares. And to that extent, they become members of the capitalist class. So I, I'm just introducing some nuances from the perspective of class analysis to Piketty's uh, theory. So if we want to really understand and even alter what's going on as inequality creates social and economic distance between the poor and the rich, we must go beyond income and wealth trends to identify the class relations that generate escalating economic inequality. And it is those class relations that also need to be addressed. And one way to address them is, for instance, with worker ownership in firms, you know, expand, uh, devising ways of expanding ownership in firms. 